Welcome. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Sweet. Everyone at home is doing good. Um, I wanted to start out um, just kind of asking everybody just a random question. Uh, for those of you who have your cameras on, uh, if you want to turn your cameras on for this, I was going to ask how many people here, for how many people here is being of service and um, being uh, generous and, and kind to people? How, if, raise your hand if that's a priority for you. <laughs> we'll see Princeton came on. Thank you. Thank you. So as I expected, that's pretty much everybody. Laura, thank you for the digital hand. That's awesome. <laughs> um, and just, I don't know, I just, uh, I wanted to talk about being of service and what that means today. And I just, you know, we have all different kinds of clubs and all different kinds of tribes and groups that we belong to. Uh, and we all have different things in common with those different tribes. And so I was just really kind of touched. I always am reminding myself that I'm a part of this community of people who really care about being of service to the world. And what a gift that is. You know, I've been a part of groups where career is the thing that we all care about, or being famous was the thing that we all cared about, or being cool was the thing that we all cared about. Um, but we're a part of this community where like every, pretty much everyone that joins us really cares about being good to the world and being a good influence, being of service. Um, and so I, whenever I remember that, it just, uh, it touches me. And I love to see that in person and see all of you. Um, so yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about being of service. I gotta get my text open here. I was supposed to do this as we were chanting. What you gonna do? Um, so as many of you know, we've been reading this book by Zenju Earthlin Manuel. It's called The Deepest Peace. basically one long poem or a collection of long poems and it's really beautiful every i mean we're just all in love with Zenju right now she's such a great great writer and a great uh influence on modern zen in america so i just wanted to take a little passage uh from this book for those of you in the book club i'm sorry for the redundancy here but it's just so alive and so good. Um, yeah, let's just dive right in. So she says, we go to great lengths to save all beings from disappointment, from dissatisfaction and from despair. Some promise to suffer as long as there is suffering. Instead, I walk alongside the sufferer. I offer the best dose of liberation I can muster up without a word spoken. I think this is a really powerful passage as far as being of service for those of us who care about being of service. Um, and so, you know, just like any text, just like any point of practice in our life, as it comes up, uh, we can look at it like a koan and really investigate each part of it and really get intimate with what the words or the situation is saying. Um, and I, I'm reminded, you know, whenever I kind of think about talks or if I'm working on a koan, I always remember my 12th grade English teacher, Mr. Wilf, because uh, we did a lot of like poetry analysis in that class. And I remember one of his things was like, when you're reading a poem, really look at every single word look at the very first word and just see what comes up what is it trying to say and that just always really stuck with me um and it kind of makes sense in life too right like sometimes if you're having an interaction 
with somebody or if you encounter something, looking, paying attention and being mindful of every little detail, every little thing can really like imply or open up, reveal a lot more than we thought. Um, for instance, you know, if you're with a friend and they want to address something with you and they say, hey, I, I wanted to talk to you about this thing. Then just that first word, hey, means something different than if your friend was like, hey, I want to talk to you about something. <laughs> um, that's, you know, the subtleties and the nuances of our speech. Uh, if we really take the time to be super detailed and look at every last little bit, uh, we realize that everything affects everything. Each little word, each little implication, each gesture, everything ripples out and affects everything else. So if we're looking at this uh, phrase from Zenju, just look at the first word, we. It's very ambiguous. Who is she talking about? Is she talking about just the people reading the book, her and, the, and her audience? Is she talking about Buddhists? Is she talking about only good people who raise their hand when they, you know, when they're asked if being kind is a priority to them? Is she talking about just Westerners? Is she talking about religious people? You can kind of do that forever until you get to everybody. Maybe she's talking about everybody. We go to great lengths to save all beings from disappointment and despair. So what would that look like if she's talking about everybody? The Buddha said when he had his enlightenment, that was his thing. Wonder of wonder, intrinsically all beings have the wisdom and compassion of the Tathagata. The Tathagata meaning Buddha, awakenedness. So like we go to great lengths. Every single one of us, does that include politicians we don't like? <laughs> does that include mean people? Does that include Jeff Bezos? <laughs> you know, you can go all the way. Does that include uh, Attila the Hun? Does that include um, that Sudanese dictator who is awful? Uh, I forgot his name now. Um, anyway, it just reminds me, I remember when I was in, I think, 11th grade, 10th or 11th grade, 2001 yeah and bush had just gotten elected and i was just kind of coming into my own and like getting the feel for politics and partisanship and world stuff current events and i remember i was just so you know i grew up in los angeles to very liberal parents and like the whole community was very like liberal very clearly a blue kind of community and i remember being very aware of this narrative that like Bush and his people were just plain evil, that they were wrong about all their ideas. Yes. And just were just bad. They just wanted evil. And I never really got that. Right. Like I, you know, I pretty much have always been uh, politically and policy wise on a very left leaning thing. Um, but I didn't really understand how everyone around me seemed to be jumping to the conclusion that they were literally trying to be bad. As if George Bush woke up every morning and said to himself, how can I make poor people suffer today? And I just didn't buy it. It didn't make sense. You know, the narrative that his ideas of how to do good for people was are wrong. That makes sense. You know, you can say that someone has the wrong ideas about how to do something, but I just, I, I couldn't not believe that George Bush or Cheney or whoever else we want to demonize didn't wake up and have some sense deep down of like, I want to make the world a better place today. Um, 
I really think that, you know, some, some really do suffer from major narcissism and major sociopathy and maybe wake up thinking just about themselves or just about power. I'm sure that happens. But, you know, Zenju is implying here, we, all of us, intrinsically, deep down, we all really want to be good for the world. Unless you really suffer from a major sociopathic um, condition, maybe, I don't know. I don't know too much about that. But to really open up to everybody, even the Ku Klux Klan member, in his or her own mind, they think they're going through to great lengths. They're living a life of hate. They're living a life of violence and aggression. <laughs> Those are great lengths because they have this really twisted idea of what would save the world. Um, that is a particular level of compassion that's hard to come by. But I try to practice with that. We all are trying to be good, whether we're super wrong about it or not. So we go to great lengths. Um, what are these great lengths? I think of protesting. I think of fighting for legislation. I think of sitting on the floor for hours at a time doing meditation. I think of dedicating one's life to service. I think of going and cleaning up the streets or cleaning showers or working at a food bank, all these difficult things, you know, going to work, sometimes just going to a difficult job so you can feed your family to save them from despair. We're all going through these great lengths to do the best we can. Um, we start wars, the civil war. We sacrificed our sons and daughters and brothers and fathers uh, to save the world from slavery or to save our country from slavery to the extent that the civil war was about slavery, at least. Um, so she's talking about that. But then there's also this kind of like sarcasm to it, right? Like we go to these great lengths to save everybody, right? Like. There's also this element of that that makes me think of like codependence, right? Codependence, um, people who suffer from codependency will give up their wishes to please someone else so that they feel needed. They'll give up, they'll sacrifice their well being uh, for someone else. And we all know those people, we all know that bit inside of us. We have to be the savior, we have to, you know, be better, we have to be. Um, a bodhisattva, whatever language we use, um, you know, there is an unhealthy side to that. And so I think, you know, that kind of that phrase, we go to these great lengths to save all beings, um, you know, being aware of when those great lengths are maybe too much. They're actually causing suffering because they're out of this kind of compulsion to be good. So it's a really nuanced deal here. Um, so just going word by word, we, we go to these great lengths to save all beings from disappointment, from dissatisfaction, from despair. So we all obviously resonate with that. We want to make the world better. We want to save people from despair. But again, there's this kind of like, it's not a sarcasm, but it's like kind of a poke, I think, that she's getting at here. Who are you to be a savior? That's such a, and, and we'll get more into it later, but it's such a, a, a separate way of seeing things. I have it better than you, let me save you. Um, you're so disappointed. Let me get rid of your disappointment for you. Let me heal you. And the kind of twist there, the nuanced part there that I think she might be pointing at 
or at least what I'm getting from it, is that disappointment and despair aren't necessarily things to be saved from. That's kind of an assumption we're already making, right? If we're talking about concepts and ideas, attachment to concepts and ideas, which we know is what causes suffering, um, to assume that despair and disappointment are things that people need to be saved from is already a concept right there. And so what would it look like to see disappointment, despair, and dissatisfaction, the three Ds? Um, what would it look like to truly open up to those as fine, as just what is, as a ticket to wisdom, right? I mean, we've heard over and over again from all different kinds of texts, from Buddhism to therapy to philosophy, all kinds of people talking about how the shadow, the darkness, the disappointment, the conflict, the challenges, we have to lean into them, right? We have to go straight into them. We can't heal ourselves unless we open up and embrace them. So in that sense, we want disappointment and despair. It's through them that we can truly penetrate and transform and heal. So if we want despair and disappointment so that we can heal them, then the wound and the healing eventually kind of become one. It's not like you want to get rid of one to be the other. You want to always invite, you want to, I want to be totally open and eager to be with despair, to be with disappointment. Because that is how we wake up. So this urge to save people from disappointment and dissatisfaction almost does them a disservice in that sense. Don't waste your time saving them from it. Walk into it with them. Help everybody embrace despair. To the point where dissatisfaction and satisfaction kind of start losing a border between them. And they're just kind of the same thing. I think, I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> uh, so she goes on. Some promise to suffer as long as there is suffering. So I think this points to the bodhisattva vow that we talk about all the time, right? If we sit long enough or if we're lucky to have uh, any kind of experience of the oneness, the emptiness of the universe, no separation, totally one with everything, um, that experience illuminates the fact that there's no such thing as suffering, right? We chant in the Heart Sutra, no suffering. It's no such thing. That is a concept and it's empty. So there's no such thing as ending suffering either because there is no suffering to begin with. But that's just half the battle, right? So we take the Bodhisattva vow to be alive in this relative reality as well, right? The absolute reality that there is no such thing as suffering. There is no separation between you and me. But because the world is alive and we exist in a relative reality, we make that promise or that vow to live within the relative reality where there is suffering. And meeting that absolute and relative reality every moment. They are both alive in every moment. And so to take that vow is to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promise to be in this relative reality where there is suffering. And I'm not going to just exist in this absolute, ah, oh, everything is empty and perfect. That doesn't do anybody any good. So notice she starts with we. We're all trying to do our best to end despair. But some, some of us really do this particular work um, and really make that promise to a little bit of separation, hold on to a little bit of separation 
and concepts and ideas so that we can be of service to people. So then she says, instead, I walk alongside the sufferer. <coughs> so instead of vowing to save everybody, promising to be a source of light, all these different ways that we can say it, um, you know, that's the, the savior complex, right? And Sason talks about that triangle of conflict, the, the savior, the perpetrator, and the victim. And uh, I forget who coined that, but we're all kind of constantly moving in and out of these three roles, uh, playing the victim, everyone's against me, playing the perpetrator, blaming folks, and playing the savior, uh, I'll make it better for you. And I think the point is that getting stuck in any one of those roles is delusion, is trying to be something as opposed to just allowing and being a source of compassion uh, no matter what the situation is. So that savior role, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be liked. I'm going to make people feel better. I vow to do whatever. Uh, there's an unhealthy side to that. And so instead, she says, I walk alongside the sufferer. So that makes me think of Bernie Glassman and his street retreats, right? Doing session or meditation retreats on the street living on the street, sleeping on the street, um, panhandling. And, you know, I can already hear a lot of my family members and friends being like, what does that do for anybody? How does that help anyone? You're just kind of, you know, pretending to do something. And I get that. I get that. It's hard. You know, it's, it's easier to think that by giving something, by taking an action, we're doing more. But, uh, you know, all I can speak on is my own personal experience and to walk alongside the suffering, to engage, to just be there with the suffering just opens up so much love and so much compassion and so much understanding. And even though there's no tangible action that's happening, even though there's no bread handed from one person to another, even though there's no house given to somebody, that sharing, that connecting, that opening of hearts and minds to the experience that someone is having ripples out. It just does. There's an energy that grows from that. There's a, an empathy that grows from that um, that I think is invaluable, even though it can't be measured in how many people are in a better situation. It can't be measured. Um, I think that those experiences through my life ripple out that compassion and empathy. And so it's all about, you know, Sason talks about that koan, how do you step off the hundred foot pole? How do you manifest your enlightenment? How do you manifest awakening? And just even the subtle things, everyone's role is different. Some of us are gonna start a homeless shelter. Some of us just really cultivate that compassion and walk alongside people and develop that empathy and just ripples out, can't be measured. As long as you're making that effort to walk alongside those who are suffering. I had a friend who recently said, I'm doing the best I can to surround myself only with people that I like. And it just seems like such a tough way to go. Trying so hard to just surround yourself with positivity and light and good and happy. I think there's so much more compassion and ease if we just embrace what is around us, whether it's despair or joy just really being present and open hearted to whatever is. I think that is a great way to be of service. So instead I walk alongside the sufferer. I offer the best dose of liberation I can muster up 
without a word spoken. How the hell do I do that? How do I be of service? How do I offer liberation, freedom, joy, um, open heartedness? How do I share that? How do I inspire that without even saying a word, without doing anything? That's obviously a lifelong practice. Um, I believe in it. I think it's a real thing. And the best way, the best kind of concrete example I can use to like talk about such a crazy thing is, um, you know, we just read this book in our uh, study group before this one, we read my grandmother's hands and he gives a real clear layout of kind of how trauma works, how trauma lives in the body and how trauma ripples out, how trauma is passed from person to person, how it's passed through genetics, how it's passed through generations. And to me, it was just a totally convincing, undeniable argument. Um, and not only does trauma do that, trauma ripples out, trauma is received, um, but so is healing. So is its opposite. So my healing, um, my embrace and my practice, our practice, everyone's just being is constantly rippling out. And so if I can bring my love and if I can bring my patience and I can bring my open heartedness just to be there, I really, without saying a word, without doing anything, just showing up with an open mind, coming from a place of not knowing and just creating a space that's open for people without saying a word, I truly believe is a very, can be a very powerful source of being of service. It's not measurable. You're not gonna save somebody's life. You're not gonna save them from despair, but you're there and your love is just radiating. And I really believe that that makes a difference without saying a word. So then she talks about compassion. Compassion is not in the realm of behavior. That was huge, like what? And it's the same thing, you don't have to say a word. You don't have to do a damn thing for compassion. Can't be measured. Um, compassion is not in the realm of behavior. It's not kindness or niceness. It's not sympathy, mercy. It's not empathy. It's not charity. Because those things require that we look upon another as not ourselves. Right? So all these actions, giving, charity, even empathy, um, those by definition require that I say, I am separate from you and I will help you, which immediately transgresses the truth of oneness. And then this reminds me of the three tenets, right? So the three tenets that we always talk about, not knowing, coming from a place of no concepts, no ideas, total oneness. And then from there, we bear witness to things, right? Just being there, just walking alongside the sufferer. And then out of that compassion comes behavior, comes the loving action, right? So from that place of just not knowing, not saying a single word, just offering, bearing witness, loving action will become clear. And sometimes that loving action is saying something. Sometimes that loving action is donating money. Sometimes that loving action is doing a street retreat. Sometimes that loving action is just being there. Nothing to do, just listening, saying that sucks. How many times, you know, that's such a cliche where you tell someone your problems, your despair, and they want to fix it. You know, I don't know what to do. What do you want me to say? You know, I don't know what else I can do for you. 
And really, you just want them to just say, damn, that sucks. I'm so sorry. There's nothing measurable. You haven't saved me from my despair. We're just sharing. We're just, I, I feel that you are sharing in my despair. And that's super valuable. That's, that's connection. That's compassion, right? Having to save someone, that's not necessarily a connection. And in my experience, I think making that connection and, you know, through compassion is just as, if not more important than throwing some kind of thing or throwing some kind of effort some way to save somebody. So compassion isn't those things. It's not behavior. It's not empathy. It's not charity. Compassion is an experience that arises in the midst of suffering. It can boil up in the deepest pain. It can only boil up in the deepest pain until it spills into the laps of those who surround you. So yeah, just sharing, sharing and being open and um, being sensitive, being open to people's despair, just being present for people's dissatisfaction is a service, allowing their suffering, their deep suffering, sharing in that suffering until it boils up and spills into all of our laps. That is true compassion. And it reminds me of another koan where a monk asks a teacher, what does it mean that Avalokiteshvara had a thousand arms and a thousand eyes? Avalokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of compassion. And they said that she had a thousand arms and a thousand eyes to be compassionate and help serve or save all the people in the world. And so this monk is curious, like, what is true compassion? What does it mean to have a thousand arms and a thousand eyes? And the teacher says, it's like grabbing for your pillow in the middle of the night. Right? So just imagine that you're like kind of asleep, half asleep. And without even thinking, without even making any kind of effort, you just kind of naturally, just so naturally and unconsciously, just grab for your pillow and prop it up a little bit. And that, I think, speaks to this kind of compassion. It's not about conscientiously making some kind of effort to be some kind of person to help some other kind of person. It's just this natural, untethered, effortless being open. Um, not needing to do anything, just allowing the suffering of the world to boil up and allow it to burn you and allow it to burn them and just share in it. And then from that place, then we can take action, right? It's not saying don't take action, don't do charity, don't donate, don't go help, don't volunteer. It's not saying that. But to also cultivate this non-doing place, this non-behavior compassion, um, it just adds so much connection to the activity. You know, I, I work with various nonprofits and the amount of folks who come to just do the volunteering, you know, maybe they want a letter, you know, to say that they did it or they feel good about themselves. They don't talk to anyone there. They don't try to get to know the folks that they're serving. They just want to feel good, you know, and it's great. And it's great that they do that. But there's really this element of connection that's missing. And uh, I encourage all of us who raised our hands, who really care about being of service to folks, that we really get in touch with the wordless, effortless service that we all are intrinsically. <laughs>